Welcome to the Swing Space Salon. Adrian, take it away. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, before we start tonight's salon, the Wing Space Salon Submit Committee, Adrian Jones, Edward Morris, Elizabeth Mack, Luke Cantarella, Kate Freer, Leanne Arnold, Lee Savage, want to acknowledge this moment in our industry and society. Uh, we uh, started the virtual salon series in response to the needs of our community in the middle of a global pandemic. Two weeks ago, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matters protests, we decided to take a pause to center what we felt was more immediate and important. As we resume salon programming, we want to name racism and racist systems as central forces that have shaped our history in the American theater and its institutions, including Wing Space. We are a volunteer community organization um, and are not qualified to speak for all of Wing Space membership at this time. And we look forward to sharing more in the future about actions we will take as an organization. We always invite feedback, which is one of the ways in which we can hold each other accountable. You can always reach us at salons at wingspace.com. Um, more, a little more about Wing Space now. Wing Space uh, is an organization of theater artists that fosters conversations on design, strengthens our community, and furthers activism in the field. Our virtual salon series is one of a number of initiatives led by our membership, in addition to our mentorship program and the Wing Space Relief Fund, launched in partnership with Notch Theater Company to provide unrestricted rapid relief grants to NYC-based freelance designers and dramaturgs experiencing acute financial strain related to COVID-19. We are continuing to fundraise to attempt to meet the needs of the NYC freelance design com community. So please contribute if you are able. There are four of us here who are uh, going to present the sustainable production uh, toolkit. I am Edward Morris. Uh, he, him. I'm a set and projection designer, and I teach at the new school, and uh, I'm a member of Wing Space. Uh, pass it to Lauren. Hi, I'm Lauren Gaston. I'm a costume designer and illustrator, she, her, and I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. My name is Sandra Goldmark. I'm a set designer, and I teach design at Barnard College, where I also serve as the Director of Sustainability and Climate Action for the campus and also wanted to say thank you to Wing Space for welcoming us here. It's wonderful to be here. Hi, my name is Mike Banta. I'm the production manager for the theater department at Barnard College and uh, also big thanks to Wing Space and it's nice to see so many friendly, well, names and faces in the participants list. Thanks, Edward. All right, to kick us off, um, as we all just said, we're a group of four backstage artists who share a passion for sustainability and have been working on an initiative to promote um, environmental and social well being within our industry. Uh, the document that we plan to share with you tonight is geared towards you, uh, theater managers, production managers, stage managers, and artists for whom sustainability is of interest. Um, this, this document is ultimately intended to be a read through guide. So we'll hit the highlights tonight, including um, concrete tools for creating theater more sustainably and more equitably. Um, thank you to Wing Space for acknowledging where we are right now and for the land acknowledgement. Um, as they so um, eloquently said, uh, we're here tonight in the midst of a pandemic, a worldwide fight against racism and white supremacy and um, while many artists and organizations face an uncertain financial future, um, these crises, we see them as connected and interrelated. And while we're not here tonight with solutions for every problem, um, we do believe that the right solutions for any of these issues will consider how they intersect. 
Um, and we recognize the historic lack of diversity in both theater and the traditional environmentalist movement, uh, the patterns of extraction and exploitation that shape our economy and lead to climate change disproportionately destroy communities of color in this country and around the world. Um, so as we assess how to move away from an extractive model um, to a more regenerative one, we aim to hold this work within the context of a just transition. Um, a worldview that centers on caring and sacredness versus consumerism and a colonial mindset. Um, a purpose that fosters ecological and social well-being versus consolidation of wealth and power and start to utilize a regenerative approach to resources versus a model of take, make, and waste. Um, and begin to build work cultures that center on cooperation, celebration, and not exploitation. Um, there can be no real progress towards a sustainable future without dismantling structural racism and ending violence against Black, Brown, and Indigenous peoples. Um, this presentation is a starting point as we reflect on how we can um, incorporate and amplify the voices most impacted by climate change and systemic racism. Um, and because these problems cannot be solved by any one person, we, we warmly welcome your participation, feedback, and collaboration. Thank you. So um, we're going to we're not going to show you this is a big document we've created. Um, we're going to give you some highlights, as Lauren said. This is the table of contents to give you a sense of the way that we're structuring the document. Um, the first section that I'll give you a little taste of is called making the case. Um, the, the, the goal of this introductory section is to help theaters think about how to generate buy in, how to form a shared converse, conversation and how to manage change within an organization. Um, one of the key themes of this section is to relate sustainability back to your mission and to other core initiatives that you are working on because we do think they're interconnected. So this si slide, for example, is called the why and we're giving some uh, suggestions and some ideas of, of why we think that theater should engage in this work. Um, some highlights are that we think that now is a time for theaters to show leadership um, in tackling these big issues. Um, we also think that there are opportunities here for fundraising and development. And we also wanna tackle the outdated notion that sustainability is necessarily always more expensive or pricier or luxury. We think that that uh, can really change, especially if you think about sustainability, uh, focusing on spending money on people, prioritizing people in your organization and in your community. Um, so the next slide is one example from this section and it's talking about framing conversation. This is where we um, pose some questions about um, how you can relate this to your organization's mission. And we have links to, for example, some worksheets where you could you know, pull some terms and connect, connect them to some of the key ideas. Um, we also have a link to a video um, and somebody's email. No. <laughs> so this is just to give you a, oh, you don't have to go to the video. This is just to give you a sense of how the slides are structured. So I won't pause on the next two slides, but as we go through, we're looking at um, how to balance the tension between small initiatives and big thinking and how to make these initiatives a habit. So when it comes to sourcing responsibly, um, like I mentioned before, it means moving from a take make waste model in favor of regenerative design and production, more of a make use and return model. Um, so this means managing how we use resources differently. It means uh, prioritizing reuse, responsible sourcing and designing with the circular life in mind, assessing um, where that costume, that prop, that, um, that lumber is going at the end of its life that is not ideally not a landfill. Um, so when making material choices, the, we all face tight budgets and timelines and buying new materials is a reality. So um, hitting the highlights here, when choosing new materials, a few things to consider is whether or not it's toxic, is it recyclable, um, and or multi-use, that would be the top priority.
Um, and this is an example of a few sources in the tri-state area. I found it helpful um, to create a working document of secondhand stores and donation centers so that I have that on hand when mapping out my strike plan at the beginning of the process, uh, which saves a headache at the end. So this is truly a snapshot of the, the resources um, and a few of them just speaking to costumes uh, specifically for a moment offer pickup, which really helps when working with the costume shop because um, it uh, saves time. Hi, um, so I just wanted to back up one second and and say that I'm not sure that we said this explicitly before. This document right here is more or less framed uh, towards production managers and um, uh, technical managers in general. Um, so we wanted to give some concrete tools to those people who um, who might be wondering how they can get started. Um, one of the, uh, well, at Barnard, we, we committed several years ago to, to uh, working towards sustainable production as a, as a chief goal. And we realized fairly early that we needed a target to work towards. Um, and once we decided we needed a target, we realized we needed a way to track it, to measure our, our progress and our, our impact. So we reworked our, our budget sheet to be able to track used materials. And later we added stock materials as well. Um, and so each element in our budget is estimated and then tracked later for actual expenditures in each of those categories. And um, we, starting from the beginning, we, we uh, some of you I'm, I can see in the, in the participants list, some of you have designed uh, for us at Barnard and our approach has evolved, but some of you will remember probably early conversations about we uh, prioritize sustainability, we dedicate no more than 50% of our materials purchases to, to new and everything else should be um, used and stock. And we're still sort of evolving our approach on that. And um, it, we found that most people are at the beginning are gung ho about that, but it so runs counter to the training that is inculcated at, at uh, well, I can only speak directly for Yale School of Drama, but um, to sort of fill the black box with anything you can imagine approach. And so we're asking people to, to come at it from a different direction. Um, so here we're uh, valuing our stock. Instead of calling stock a $0 item, we actually put a value on it and we track it just like anything else. It's not money that is spent on the production, but we feel that um, a $0 valuation on stock leads to considering those things to be worthless, whereas they are actually extremely valuable pieces of, of the inventory and uh, tools for reducing the material impact of the production. And probably the most important point uh, to this is that as we've shifted our emphasis to using stock and um, minimizing new materials purchases, we've saved a fair bit of money on materials and we've been able to make a permanent shift towards increasing the, amount of, the money that we spend on people, um, increasing our design fees, increasing our overhire rates. Um, and this just seems like really good sense to us to, to not buy new materials that will that will very soon be thrown in the landfill, but to, to uh, pay the people working on the show more. I imagine that that uh, few people would disagree with that on this call. Um, we've assembled a list with Justin Miller's help. I think Justin is on the call um, of uh, shop practices that, that shops can put into practice right away, hopefully. And a case study. So um, in order to, to show real world examples, we've sprinkled case studies in each section. And this is a design by Edward Morris, made entirely from recycled doors and windows. Now for the costume section. Um, so speaking more generally about textile production, just for a second, zooming out. Um, when it comes to take, make waste, textile production is among the biggest 
offenders. Um, using this estimation by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation here on this page, um, by the time we leave here tonight, there should be 7,200 garbage trucks worth of clothing incinerated or landfilled, um, which is truly staggering. Um, and textile production has a, has a history of exploitive labor, um, child labor, immense greenhouse gas emissions, water pollution, use of hazardous um, conditions and chemicals. Um, and I acknowledge that the theater industry operates on an entirely different scale in comparison to the fast fashion industry, um, which is largely successful in the backbone of natural resources and capital, which are quickly depleting. Um, but it's worth knowing this context when it comes to designing and choosing resources that positively impact um, people and our planet. Um, so communicating and commit. Um, I have found it helpful to set quantitative goals when it comes to um, sustainability within the costume department. Um, for example, 50% new, 50% uh, reused. Uh, there's been a couple of shows that I've worked on where I've set a goal of 100% textile scrap recycling, working with the costume shops. Um, I utilize fab scrap within my own studio and um, when working as a costumer on Dickinson and uh, Many Saints of Newark, where I was able to work with the lead tailor um, to utilize a textile recycling program at the end of the season. Um, and the other example on here is a um, picture from Beauty and the Beast designed by Jacqueline Duran. And she worked closely with um, Emma Watson who played Belle to commit to 100% sustainable costume using GOT certified fabrics, um, beautiful vintage dead stock fabrics to create that look. Um, so while there's a big list of people that you can communicate and collaborate with um, within your team, I think it's helpful to start with um, the person that might be most willing, someone who's mentioned sustainability before. And for me, that's been the costume shops. Uh, this is a really great chart made by the clothing brand Reformation. They break down um, most sustainable to least sustainable in terms of textiles. They take into consideration water input, energy input, land use, ecotoxicity, greenhouse gas emissions, I think human toxicity, availability, and um, price. And just quickly looking at the chart on the far left, the A, the all stars, those are all um, natural fibers that are rapidly renewable, plant-based, and have a potential for circularity, whereas all the way on the right and that you never use, uh, fibers that are too environmentally or socially intensive. So for Reformation, their commit um, and quantify moment is they commit to using no more than 10% from this column in their clothing production line. And briefly, a costume case study. Um, this was a dance piece I was designing until uh, COVID-19 uh, brought us to a halt. Uh, this was choreographed by Jody Sperling of Time Lapse Dance, and she names and commits to sustainability as part of Time Lapse Dance uh, core mission. And for this piece, she sought to explore the impact of single use plastics on our bodies and in our oceans. So we were able to achieve a 50% new, 50% um, reuse. But the thing that I was uh, most proud of was because we did reuse our materials, budget went down, um, increase, increasing our labor budget. And for the artisans that were involved on this highly specific and specialized project, they were able to name their rate. Hi, um, again, so uh, the prop section has a lot in common with the scenery and costume sections uh, with a focus on prioritizing reuse sourcing responsibly and creating a non toxic shop when you do have to make new. Um, I did want to point out again with the idea that the goal of this um, of this whole toolkit is to provide people with tools. We've also have in the scenery section a, um, an indication of why we're so so much emphasizing reuse. There's a study that we commissioned at Barnard showing that by switching from, let's say, a 50-50 show used versus new to 
um, one that's 100% um, used, you can cut your carbon emissions uh, by 75%. So we think that it's useful for an organization to have access to data like that. So if you do need to make the case or really give people a why, we're trying to put into this toolkit some, some things so you don't have to look it all up yourself. Um, another tool we're trying to share here is um, we've mentioned, Michael mentioned valuing stock. We did this for scenery, costumes, and props. And when we started this, we said, well, how do we put a dollar value on every item in our costume stock or in our prop stock? It's definitely impossible to go through it all. <laughs> so we came up with a system where we averaged, we took a whole season, uh, in this case props, but we did it for costumes as well. We took a whole season and we averaged every purchase um, or rental, everything we, every time we spent money on a prop in that season, and we came up with this average cost of $27.73. So this might really vary per organization, but this is what we're trying to provide here is a way, a tool that people might adapt for their own purposes. And there would be connected with this a Google Drive with a uh, spreadsheet template so that people could customize the spreadsheet for themselves and not have to rebuild it. Um, and then we have a case study. This is about non-toxic studio. This we've seen. We have a case study of a uh, book of well I did in Denver Center for the Performing Arts. The whole set and all the props and set dressing were reclaimed. And the props team just really did an amazing job. They, they made this world rich and layered and it was, it was really wonderful to work there and, and they got really into it. So we wanted to give them a shout out. <laughs> So, uh, lighting then. Edward. <laughs> Sorry. It's cool. Um, so lighting is a little bit of a different, uh, a different animal from the, the three areas we've mentioned so far because so much of it is either about the energy consumed or the, the large purchases of new equipment. So um, rather than expendables, which are a part of it, but um, energy and, and equipment seemed to be much bigger portion. So we thought one easy step uh, to start with would be finding out where the energy comes from and seeing if you have an option to switch to renewables. And uh, there are resources linked on the slide for finding out a renewable energy sources in your state. And uh, I believe that Curtis uh, Kazafang, I'm realizing I've never actually said his name out loud, but I I think that's uh, how it is. I think he's on this call and he generously shared um, his take on upgrading permanent systems or theatrical systems from conventional to LED fixtures and uh, taking them in order using um, the, the most, changing out the most often used systems or the, mo the systems that are on for the biggest portions of time, which does not, uh, mean stage lighting. Stage lighting is actually at the last, the last of, on the list. So starting with rehearsal room lighting and, and house lights and work lights. Um, and so working from some real world figures, we put together a simple sheet that can help a production manager or a theater start to think about what the energy use uh, might be on their conventional systems, what the maintenance costs are, and compare that to um, an LED replacement system and uh, think about how, how much time it would take for it to pay for itself. Great, and um, with a little bit of overlap with lighting, uh, we have uh, some brief sections here. Um, uh, in sound, uh, we'll dis discuss equipment sourcing, uh, battery practices, uh, but truth to be told, we're a little light uh, on this. And so part of this Wing Space Salon is we're, we're looking for if anyone else has other resources that they'd like to share, uh, we, we'd love to know about them. Um, uh, as you can see here, um, uh, sourcing responsibly, making sure that your equipment is energy efficient is very, uh, is very important. Um, and uh, a lot of stuff with sound can overlap with lighting in terms of uh, getting away from one-time use objects. So 
uh, in sound, we hear a lot about uh, one-time use batteries and uh, a lot of Broadway has, uh, you know, switched over to uh, recyclable batteries, which is fantastic. Uh, but there are other opportunities for that, such as using Velcro instead of a one-time use tie line and trying to use a yes, less gaff tape, which is of course, just like a single use material uh, and using more cable runs uh, and that sort of thing. Um, we're now gonna uh, step a little bit away from the, the technical sides and talk about uh, stage management. Um, so uh, in stage management, you can focus on getting a buy-in from uh, management and the community. Uh, and uh, we'll go over some specific tips and tricks here. Um, uh, the first thing is to uh, bring everyone on board, uh, talk to your equity representative, talk to company management, production management, um, budget time to paint the company with the theater sustainability goals. Uh, and uh, one of the biggest things that we do in the, in the rehearsal room is uh, trying to attack the use of single use pla plastics and move away uh, from them. And um, right. Uh, a lot of these tips uh, cost the company absolutely nothing in terms of becoming like either a Broadway green captain. Um, so all the members, people presenting in this group have gotten a lot of inspiration from the Broadway Green Alliance, uh, who's also given some feedback on this presentation and um, going to them or there's a Chicago Green Theater Alliance uh, to get simple tips to share with your team. Um, and then the main thing that stage management can do is to cut down on paper waste. So uh, Jonathan Bach from uh, the Wicked team uh, shared uh, some uh, the idea of a portal that he's made for several Broadway shows. They're tailored for each show, but what they do is they um, uh, traditionally backstage, there's a wall of folders that has all sorts of um, paperwork for uh, injury reports, uh, time off requests, etc. To build a proprietary um, a portal for each show is a way to cut way down on stage management labor time, uh, company management labor time, and also to uh, minimize your paper waste backstage. Um, again, uh, something that uh, sadly the the authors of this are not an expert in, uh, but we have uh, we've talked with some a couple of development professionals, and we're trying to work on this. Um, as you all know, we are uh, in a time where theaters are are concerned mainly with sustainability in any financial sense, much less much less environmental sustainability. Um, but what I I think really ties in with a lot of theaters missions and going back to what I think everyone has sort of hit on is focusing on people instead of things uh, is the idea of trying to develop a more sustainability sponsorships. Um, so this is where a production manager and a development uh, director can really work closely. Um, a production manager given some re uh, research can perhaps put together uh, and given how much time they do or don't have, they could put together a, a pitch for how much it would take to make, for example, a costume shop to use fab scrap for a whole year, uh, working up to how much it would cost to make a, a single production uh, sustainable, either at like the Barnard level where it's 50% or even more than that, um, or to, uh, if one has a great deal of time, to put together a pitch for how, how much uh, it would cost to make a full season more sustainable for a theater. And the idea is that uh, those can then be directed at uh, institutions uh, and uh, larger organizations uh, to help either angle up or come to them with a new development tool. Um, sorry, I'm paying attention to my script here. Uh, and yeah, I think we'll go back to Sandra here. We'll, we'll just let's just show the worksheets quickly and then we'll conclude so we have to sort of skip ahead to them we designed a series of worksheets um, as a way for your organization to facilitate some of these uh, conversations and begin to design your own working solutions um, the aim is sort of to build a shared language around sustainability um, and also define sustainability within the context of your unique mission, your vision, your values, um, as well as your capacity. Um, that's going to be a little different um, for every organization. And um, I think the important thing to remember with these worksheets um, and with the guide we've presented tonight, these are um, what is 
what have worked for us. But again, we look forward to hearing from you in terms of what other um, feedback and ideas we can incorporate. So, um, so there, I think Edward's showing you a little bit of some of the, the draft um, tips and worksheets we're trying to share. And I just wanted to return to this. First of all, thank you for coming and for your attention. Um, this is a time of, of really great upheaval in this country and in this industry. We're facing a global pandemic. We're facing major economic problems. We are fighting systemic racism. And, um, and behind it all, climate change is there and is not going away. So um, really, thank you for taking the time to come and talk about this. And our hope is that we can, uh, as we move into a conversation about this, we can talk both about the ways that some of these issues and problems intersect and overlap um, how we can begin as a community to uh, find a way forward from this moment of reckoning. Um, and we are also very interested in your specific feedback, tips, things we've missed. Um, we're looking for co contributors. There's a contributor slide that um, I don't know where it is right now, but um, we would love to see your name on there and your ideas in here. This is not, uh, not yet, you know, far from complete. Um, so uh, Lauren, I think, is going to drop a survey in the chat if you want to do complete a survey afterwards. And I'll hand it over to Danielle, who will moderate a conversation. So thank you again for coming. And I can't wait to hear your guys' ideas. Amazing. Thank you. Let's go back to our, all of our screens. Um, I'd like to see everybody's faces. That was great. And if as many people as possible can turn on their uh, screens, because I think this would be great to have a dialogue. Um, what we have found is um, talking about sustainability is truly a conversation. And so I'm amazed. Um, I, I just, I'm so impressed with uh, the four guests today. I would love to hear about how you how you started, how you came together to um, really want to tackle some of these um, some of these issues in, with sustainability and how you even met each other. Lauren. Thanks, Danielle. Um, yes, it might it might have been obvious from my portion of the presentation, but I my gateway was textiles, um, working in various costume shops uh, early on in my career, just seeing the huge amount of textile waste that um, ended up in the trash versus at donation centers or upcycled in some way. Um, and funny enough, the four of us. I have not, <clears throat> at least for me, I have not met my fellow colleagues in person <laughs> yet, because we really started this um, during in pandemic conditions. Um, but um, Edward and I were actually working on a production of The Lion in Winter um, at Gulf Shore Playhouse, um, which was unfortunately canceled. Um, so yes, I look forward to meeting them in person <laughs> after this is all over. That's kind of incredible. <laughs> um, uh, so, I mean, but literally, how did you, how, like Sandra and, and how did you all, how did Lauren, how did you meet Sandra and, and uh, Mike? So, so I've known Sandra for a long time, probably from uh, a long ago uh, wing space salon that we had on green model making. Um, and uh, I worked with Sandra at uh, Barnard. I did a, a there, there were some images there of, uh, show that Michael and I did at Barnard. Um, actually, Lauren and I just saw Sandra give a Broadway Green Alliance Green Quarantine. We should put a, a link to that in the chat. Um, uh, and we just decided to to start working on this. I, I feel I feel sort of foolish. We tried to, we skipped over a lot of stuff um, in the in in the interest of making sure that we got to questions and we sort of went too quickly. And I'm I mean, I, I'm interested in hearing more from Sandra and Michael, but also from people, if you want to put something in the chat, if you did see something that we that we skipped over and you particularly want us to return to, let us know that, please. You know what? Hey, Anya, why don't you ask your question? I think that's really great. If you can. Unmute yourself, Anya. Sorry, thank you, thank you, thank you all for this. This is so amazing. Um, I wanna know more, uh, can you speak more about how 
sustainability intersects with systemic racism. I feel like I could get more buy-in from my department um, if I could present, you know, right now is this moment where every everybody is really interested in. One, I don't think people have clear um, in their mind how everything is connected. So I would love it if you guys could speak more to that. Well, from my... Uh... My, my perspective and what I've been studying and in my work at Barnard, we've really been talking about the first and most, well, I don't know which is most important. One key thing is that environmental impacts uh, disproportionately impact communities of color in the United States and all around the world. So if you are already interested in working on that issue, um, this the, they intersect very directly economically, health impacts, social impacts. So that's one. The other for me, kind of a little bit zooming out and thinking about the systems that fuel climate change, it's basically an extractive linear model rooted in the colonial system, right? Like if you think about um, going to a land and taking the people from it or going to a land and taking the raw materials from it, the, the, the process is actually, or the mentality is actually very similar. So. And there's all kinds of amazing scholarship about this that I'm not really doing justice to right now, and I'd be happy to, and actually that's a great idea. We could put a link, a slide in this document with some amazing scholarship, because um, it's, 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 um, it's out there. And there's some really amazing groups right now that are talking about it, particularly right now, some of the indigenous activism is really taking, I would say, um, well, there's a lot of groups talking about the intersection here, but, um, that would be, that's a, I'm going to take that as a suggestion and put in a slide with resources to scholarship. Thank you. I, I, I also have a piggyback, but I can put that in the comments if someone needs to go next. Well, Anya, actually, go ahead. Okay. All right. So uh, I think that many artists, designers, directors would have a hesitation around sustainability, which is, um, how do I respond to the material uniquely, authentically, without having the, um, the aesthetic driven by what's available? That, that feels like a really obvious, you know, clunky issue that um, I feel like there, there need to be good, really strong answers around this to help get buy-in. I think one uh, one way we've addressed that uh, in in other forums is to is to treat the restriction of working with a certain set of materials as a possible creative uh, driver rather than feeling it as a as a limitation or a negative to say we all work within constraints as uh, Sandra has pointed out many times you work within a budget you work within a theater uh, there are already constraints to impose one more. Is just something that we that we work with, and there's no. Uh, it's really just a habit to say that. Well, we have we have to work within this budget and work within the theater, but we can put anything in there that we can buy. So, it takes a, a bit of a of a shift of mindset. But uh, does any any of my collaborators have something to add? On to that um, just a little bit, but I think the starting point is really having the conversation first with your organization in terms of defining sustainability for yourself and, and establishing that link to your mission and vision and values. Um, Cause I just speaking back to the costume case study um, in that instance where the choreographer had named sustainability as part of her core mission, um, you know, the constraint of sustainability within the design process really became um, a collaborative co-creative back and forth on how we could achieve the design and how we could um, pivot based on available resources. You know, she had one idea in mind initially, which really evolved over the um, over the course of several design phases. Um, so yeah, I think it's about having the conversation first. That's great, thank you. You know, Sandra, in your design, um, I didn't feel, just looking at it in the photographs, I didn't feel like you had to make sacrifices. Can you talk about that? I did. I, I did have a moment, though, of several years where Anya's sort of worry was one that I, I had too, where I thought, gosh, is every show I'm going to do from here on out going to totally look the same? <laughs> and I thought, 
so one, I consciously took that challenge on and I said, okay, I'm not going to have every show look like the kind of grab bag from the prop closet from here on out. And, and I also decided to really consciously embrace it as a limit to say, I would never do a show, for example, where I don't ever want to do a show uh, where, um, you know, small children are harmed in doing it, right? It's just a hard line for me. And I think we're all talking about some hard lines that we need to draw in our community right now anyway, on, a, on um, related topics, like how are we gonna work? And to me, this is a related line that we have to say, it's not worth it. And I think every designer I can see in this Brady Bunch is gifted enough to face the challenge of saying, gosh, I don't want this limit to restrict my design. I want it to inform it and fuel it just the way you would rise above the challenge of like a small budget or a small loading dock door or a weird column in the theater or any of the other weird limitations we've all faced. <laughs> yeah, I think um, speaking as like, I, I'm not a sustainable designer, but I just, it's sort of like a muscle. Like if you design two shows a year, you're naturally gonna be less confident than if you are designing eight or 10 shows a year. And the more shows that you approach with like the first thing that you do, you ask the shop, like, what did you buy too much of last year? Like if you just start every single process doing that, uh, then you're naturally gonna start thinking about, now, you know, I, I don't always succeed at this. There are plenty of shows that I do that, that are not sustainable. But if I, from the get go, if I always ask at like, a number of questions of the of the technical team and get them excited about it from the beginning that I'm much more likely to arrive at a sustainable thing. And what's sort of interesting is uh, be interested when people give feedback about um, we're, we aren't approaching this as much in this presentation from the um, from the design standpoint. You know, Danielle, me, Sandra, we all actually have like different uh, presentations on that. Um, uh, and seeing how much we can what I'm hearing from you is maybe we need to incorporate a lot more of the designer buy-in uh, as well as the, the manager buy-in uh, into this moving forward, perhaps. Yeah, that, I mean, I just want to do one little um, you know, question on that, and then we'll get to some of the travel questions. Um, so, you know, I'm really interested in the conversation. Um, Mike, you're a production manager and everybody else is a designer. So that relationship often is very fraught as, as a lot of people know. How, Michael, how do designers start talking to production managers about this? Because we all know that a lot of production managers are like, uh-uh, not gonna go there. Um, what really made your mind change and what can you help, what, can, what advice can you give to designers of how we can start having these conversations? Well, I, I think uh, you're not wrong, Danielle. Um, and I think we're, as I mentioned now, maybe I, maybe I've spoken a little out of turn, but I think that we're, we've we've crafted this the presentation or the document that we just shared as primarily being focused towards production managers because I think often when uh, a designer opens that conversation with with people in production who often feel put upon and asked to do too much with too little, like most of us are anyway, um, they, they say, well, I can't do this on top of all the other things that I do. I can't reinvent this wheel right now. So um, the idea of this presentation is to put some tools sort of um, preemptively or proactively into the hands of the, of the production people um, so that they don't feel like they're being blindsided. Um, but, you know, since I have been uh, kind of I've chosen to go down this road uh, for several years now, I might not be the best production manager to answer that question um, because it seems more often than not um, that I'm opening the conversation with the designers because we've made it our, our mission at Barnard. Um, and I think a lot of people are sort of pleasantly surprised to say, oh, that I would love to do that. That sounds great. But we're not hearing that from other from other people and hopefully that is what we're going to or what we're trying to work on changing but maybe one of the designers here could uh, well probably all of you have have stories about uh, about dealing with production on these things is there a production manager in this uh, in the zoom room great do, do one of y'all want to uh give us some feedback 
there's significant fireworks in my neighborhood. So apologies for the ridiculous sound coming from my from my microphone. Um, so uh, I'm Nikki Mills. I use she for her pronouns. Um, I'm the production manager for special events and studio projects at the Yale School Drama and Yale Repertory Theater. Um, uh, I, I address um, everything I do with an eye towards sustainability. So I, I hope that, oh my goodness, I hope that um, that is becoming more of the norm. Um, similar to what Mike um, expressed, I, I, because I start with that um, in the conversations when we're talking with designers at the beginning, even potentially before we have, uh, we, well, before we send off the folks to do the designing, um, it's, it starts to be a given. Um, and, I've, and I've got a lot of support from the folks that I've worked with. And like, like the um, presenters have talked about, it can be, and for me often is, um, a savings. So it, from, from my perspective, where I focus on budget and schedule and people, um, it's, it's absolutely a win in, in, every, in every avenue. Do you, um, Justin, do you feel the same way? Um, I do a, a bit. I feel like my 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 approach was a little different because I came into a new company with a lot of pre-existing designers who already had their preconceived notions about how to work with this particular company. So my big push was uh, was really towards uh, using stock, sharing pieces between shows, and. You know, seeing seeing what big things we could build and use for for more than one show uh and that kind of that kind of turned into well if i can get my designer to come and see what's coming up next or if we can talk about what's in stock or if i can make sure i know what's in stock in advance to let them let them have and help convince them that if you know if they use this they can spend their their tech time uh on other things the 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 manpower of the shop on, on other things. So that, that was kind of the, the effort that I went into um, this past year with some success. And, and Sandra, you and Mike are married. How did the conversation, you're a designer, Mike's a production manager. I can imagine some, some arguments maybe about this or did it, how did you work it out? Yeah, unlike Lauren, I have worked with Michael a few times. <laughs> We've met in person. <laughs> Michael, I'll let you take this one. No, I think the question was for you. <laughs> um, I will say that even at Barnard, even when you're working with your husband and an amazing team of really close colleagues like Greg Winkler and Kara Feely, who have really helped build this program at Barnard, um, it, it, there are challenges. There are moments when it is hard to, to um, kind of stick to these principles, especially because they're self-imposed. And if we stop doing it at Barnard, nobody's, you know, there's nobody policing us instead of ourselves. So one of the things that we have started to do is actually try to institute some, some measures so that it's not all self-imposed or so that it's, it is becoming institutional and would, for example, uh, exist after, you know, if we move on. So we've started publishing the, the stats for each show in the program, which provides some accountability. Oh, and Alice Regan, Barnard colleague, who I think is on here, who has been amazing and supportive on this. Alice will always email us and she's proofreading the program and she'll say, where are the sustainability stats? And let me tell you, email from Alice Regan, you will hop on it and get those stats together. <laughs> and we're really grateful for that kind of internal accountability, um, even if it's just in a small group of friends, but because, um, it's a way to make it a, a, a system of thinking about this and prioritizing it, which, um, uh, so it becomes not voluntary, but, but a habit. That's really our goal is to make it a habit. And that's where I think we reinforce each other. Designers, do you have any questions about how, would, how do you bring this up? So, so say you are walking into a space with a production manager that has not heard of these, of sustainability or, um, or really thought about it too much? Or have you had these issues in the past? And how, like, I'm really interested in like, how do we break the ice on this? Are we gonna rely on a document or is there gonna be, are there some tips that we can start talking about to, to start implementing these kinds of ideas in our practice? Any designer have a question or what they wanna throw out? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I, I, I came in late to the presentation, sorry about that. Um, but Sandra, I really liked your TED talk. And um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for that too, Sandra and all your work um, and Michael and everyone else for hosting this. Um, how do people feel about all the flying that goes into the business of theater making? Because I've just read, you know, Greta Thunberg who stopped flying and she convinced her parents to stop flying. Um, it just seems like in the past, it was so fast paced that that's the nature of it. Um, yeah. Really, really good question. Um, there is no slide on flying in our presentation. You did not miss the air travel slide. We've, we should probably talk offline if we wanna address it at all in this, cause it's a really good question. For any theater outside, for, for most theaters, their number one emissions are gonna be coming from air travel. Um, so this presentation is focused on design and production sort of like without dealing with the air travel, but I certainly think there's a conversation to be had about hiring practices, about, you know, um, the, the way the whole industry is structured, um, but let's raise a really good point. Hey, uh, I mean, whether or not it's a positive or negative thing, uh, certainly after the pandemic, uh, we will see a lot more, you know, Alabama Shakespeare, they fly everyone in for a full day, um, you know, meet and greet and to see the spaces. Yeah, you know, I can't imagine that they will still do that now that they can see that they can still gather the whole team over Zoom. So. Um, that is to say, we'll lose a lot about those in-person meetings, but um, mm -hmm. you definitely identify something that we could do some more solid research on and include in this. Like I'm imagining maybe we need to provide a worksheet, it's not that hard, of how to calculate your emissions from air travel so that at least they can begin to measure it and think about it and see the numbers. And there's like, there are a number of European directors and designers who stipulate that they will only travel by train, which of course is easier there. Um, but we should, uh, we should investigate that further. How do designers feel about not traveling so much, not going for so many meetings, only showing up for tech? Leanne, how do you feel about that? Um, I think that going for a meeting can now be done on Zoom. Um, uh, the other option would be to bring people in for longer and have you more involved in rehearsal room, um, possibly even designing, you know, doing part of your designing um, there uh, on site. I think, oh, someone else about to speak. Um. I can uh, it, go ahead, Lauren, and then I'll go. I was just gonna say, um, in terms of traveling less as a designer, I do think that's very possible and saw it um, firsthand just in terms of how quickly the team Edward and I were working with at Gulf Shore started to pivot. You know, at first, oh, this pandemic, maybe we don't fly you in. Okay, so maybe we do Zoom fittings. Maybe, you know, there's just, I think there's a lot of technology we can use um, to enable us to travel less. Um, so, so a couple things. Uh, first, thank you for the great presentation and all the work it took uh, to put that together. It's great to see um, old uh, old friends gathered here and to see the uh, all the great work that's been done in this. Um, so, thank you for all of that. Um, in uh, in related to the flying question. I didn't see anything about, um, but it went by quickly, anything about the concept of offsets um, and um, the, uh, the goal potentially, um, which from my perspective is, should be the goal for anyone involved in sustainability, which is to be climate positive. That is to um, not merely minimize the harm we do that's essential, we have to do that first, but to measure what we, uh, uh, what we produce and through high quality offsets, not just get to zero, but 
to make a target of being climate positive. That is offsetting more than we contribute by doing uh, by doing uh, what we do. So it, it's that's a complicated issue. There's lots of points of view about um, offsets, the the value of them, which ones are great, etc. So it's a it's a it's a big area, but um, um, that's one of the two big questions I had. Uh, I'll get to the other one when it's appropriate in the conversation. But um, how are you dealing with the issue of a, a goal of going beyond uh, carbon neutral to climate positive? That's a great question. And I don't think we have um, an answer for that right now. I think we would, again, like Sandra was saying, since we geared this more towards um, the production managers, the designers of the group, I think that would be a great next step to incorporate that line of thinking. And I'd love to hear just opening it up if there's anyone um, attending tonight who has any opinions um, on that or any strategies that they have found successful. Anya, do you have a, you're raising your hand there. Real uh, quickly, sorry, just uh, um, we will get to Anya's question, but I just, because we're about at the hour point, I wanted to make sure that um, some things that were said, uh, some links that were sent privately at the top, I'm just gonna put them in the chat. Um, and to also just make sure that we take a minute because um, some people who are commenting are also people who contributed to this. Um, I wanted to put in a shout out for the ongoing uh, Broadway Green Alliance Green Quarantine. Um, I also put that uh, link there to uh, our, the very early and very relevant uh, conversation about um, how this links to our current political moment that Molly Braverman supplied. Um, I'm also putting in the Broadway Green Quarantine and just if you'll allow me real quick to share my screen and quickly run down um, this list. Uh, we just very briefly put them up, but I wanna just give a shout out to some of the people who looked at this, um, including a, a lot who are here. Um, and when we do eventually publish this, this will have links to them and their organizations. Uh, but the Broadway Green Alliance, uh, I see Nikki Mills, Justin Miller, Curtis is here. Um, Ian talked to us about lighting, Jonathan about stage management, Danielle, we all know her, uh, and Cornelius Booknight and Becca Nehemiah are development professionals who we spoke with. Um, but I just I just want to make sure we did not, not get to that before uh, we get too long. So I'll stop sharing. We can get to Anya's question. But, um, and as long as it's okay that we keep going, um, we're just going to do that for a little bit. Is that cool, Wing Space? Okay, yeah, Anya. Um, I just wanted to speak to the flying thing. I mean, until recently, I was definitely bemoaning every Skype Zoom meeting because it didn't feel as high quality or in person. And I feel like um, the giving up flying to be there in person with human beings in the same space means that we're ready to embrace a different kind of theater making. Um, I'm sort of referring to, uh, uh, I'm thinking, for example, um, Joseph Hodge of the Guthrie made a statement about uh, how, uh, you know, to him, theater is being physically present. Claudia Alec um, created a very theatrical vi video commenting on that point of view. So I just wanted to raise, for me, there's a connection there. The kind of theater making is connected to um, being there physically or in other ways. Thank you. Uh, Wilson Chin, you had a question about um, specific to materials and what are the um, sort of the worst. Um, actually, Wilson, do you want to ask your question? Oh, yeah. I was just asking, you know, as a set designer, what are the materials that we use on stage and in the studio that? are the worst offenders and what are substitutions that we can use? Foam. Foam is terrible. Foam. Substitutions, personally, I would offer is, um, there's paper mache, a number of other sort of built up products. Uh, sorry to step, step on anyone's presenter's toes if, uh, if this was, the question was not intended for the whole group, but uh, yeah, it's, it's bad for the environment, it's bad for the users, it's bad for everyone. I think, down, down with foam. 
I think something to throw out there is uh, if you look at a material, the farther it is from its natural state, the worse it is pretty much. That's a great rule of thumb to use. I would piggyback on Mickey's observation. We just outlawed foam in our shop uh, several years ago. Um, and when that question comes up, we just say, no, we don't use it, um, which doesn't necessarily make people happy, but it's one of those things. Like it, it's like a line, a, a red line, like Sandra mentioned. We just, you know, we don't, uh, we don't hurt children while we're making our shows. We don't use foam. What about for customers, Lauren? Um, I think the same sort of principle applies in terms of the farther away from the natural state it gets, the worse it gets. Um, there's certainly um, a ton of, you know, petroleum derived synthetics uh, like spandex is really bad. Um, you know, certain, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think what's on the list, you know, alpaca is pretty bad, um, PVC. There's a few others, but yeah, um, any of those really industrial synthetics are pretty wasteful environmentally. Another rule of thumb that um, I like to drag out is from the historic preservation world, which is, you know, the greenest object you can possibly have is the one you already have um, because you've already burnt the carbon to make it. So it's, in, in our set design, in our stock uh, storage, all of that, the more you can reuse, the better off you are, no matter what it is. Um, even if it is something that started as evil, at least if it started as evil, you're getting a lot of mileage out of that evil in the long run. I think that's exactly right, Curtis. And that's why we put such an emphasis on, on using stock. Um, we have Luan covered flats that we would hope never to use Luan anymore, certainly not. Um, the way that we used to use it. It's um, I, I probably most people know how terrible it is at this point, but now that those trees are dead, we reuse them rather than cut down happier trees now. Um, and so we find um, just saying usually to the set designer, like, look, you, you've designed this wall. If we can make it, you know, if we can just make it a foot taller, we can fit another stock flat up there, or we can move the doorway over, we can use another stock piece. And, and uh, generally people are very receptive to that kind of change. I think this uh, begins to speak to Patrick's question, which I thought was a really important question. Patrick said, so is the TD empowered to tell the designer to change the design? And I wanna say emphatically yes, for two reasons. First of all, the TD is always empowered to say we have to change the design. What if I had come in and designed something that the actors were gonna fall through the floor and break their legs? the TD would feel totally empowered to say, I'm sorry, we can't do that on this stage. And I think any TD should walk into the room with me and feel 100% empowered to say, we're not gonna use foam, we're not gonna use Luan, we're not gonna use vinyl, whatever it is. So I would say, absolutely. Um, similarly, I've, heard, I've had a million times a, a TD say to me, hey, if you make this wall one foot bigger, we'll, we'll save 500 bucks, right? So, uh, it's the same conversation to say, if we make this wall one foot bigger, we'll save you know, 500 tons of carbon emissions. It's a conversation I'm happy to have. Um, and more importantly, one of the things that I have found since I started designing this way, and this is sort of more in a, um, a more fun discovery for me has been that actually, yes, like it does change a little bit the relationship with the shop uh, in terms of the, the level of collaboration, the types of conversations. It's a deeper collaborative process. For me, it's more fun. It's more of an exchange. Um, sometimes when you're, when you're designing this way, um, sometimes you don't know what you're gonna make something out of because you haven't found it yet. So you find it together with the shop. And I personally love that. And I think it's empowering for everybody. And I think at least I wind up with a better design, so. Just in case folks don't know about Luan, can you talk a little bit about that? Is that for me? Well, um, in brief, Luan is, is made from a variety of species of, uh, of tropical hardwoods, mostly from Southeast Asia that um, at least in the, uh, in the conventional model are harvested very unsustainably, cut down from rainforests more or less. Um, now there are, um, there are sus certified sustainable 
uh, Luan products, FSC certification um, is supposed to certify that the trees are um, grown in a sustainable manner and the, the business model is sound and that sort of thing. But um, we just find that, and I think school, Yale School of Drama also does this, that Revolution Ply is a, is a better product in, in every way. So that's a, a great substitute. Um, if you're, if you can find it where you are, I think it's getting more widespread. Does that answer the question uh, about Luan, more or less? You know, Kirsty has had a question for a while. Um, Kirsty, you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you so much. Um, wonderful presentation. Um, I'm so glad I was invited to this today. Um, so I work at the Metropolitan Opera as a um, costume production supervisor. Um, and I've been considering trying to do a carbon footprint analysis of our work, at least starting in our own shop, but maybe going to other departments. I'm wondering, Sandra, when you talk about the carbon emissions um, that are sort of embodied or actually used um, in the production process, are you measuring those and or can you share resources to do so? So we measured them once because we realized it was never going to happen for every show. <laughs> like we didn't, we actually consciously did not want to build a process where every single show we were like having to do all the carbon calculations because we knew we wouldn't do it. So we hired uh, through Barnard, we we're lucky enough, you know, because it's a college um, and there's research, we got some research money to hire a consulting firm to do a carbon footprint of one of our shows, um, sets, prostum, costumes, props. They budgeted, they assessed it as built, which was 50% new, 50% used, all new and all used. So they did three models of the show. And then um, that's what we did. Cause we've, and then now we use essentially reuse as a kind of proxy measurement because we found, we really, we, the, the initial study showed us that it's a really good indicator. However, there are other tools out there if you wanna do a carbon calculation of an actual show. Um, in our presentation, we'll link to some of those tools and also we link to that study done by Gotham 360 for Barnard. Thank you. I, I wonder if Michael can, there's been some questions in the chat about uh, how you value your stock. I wonder if you can speak to that. Yeah, I've been sort of queuing things up men mentally. Um, and I know we're short on time, but I wanted to say thank you to uh, Anna Driftmeyer, who um, Leanne posted uh, a, a comment. So that's a great recommendation to talk to Tanya Beer. Thank you. And there's been a couple of comments about directors and I would just say directors are hugely important to this effort. Um, uh, Anya mentioned that earlier on, I think, and we, and we didn't address it then, but uh, you really have to have buy-in from the director. Um, it's just as important as having a designer on board with this. So uh, that, that is key. Um, so Patrick uh, asked in the chat about how do we justify the real estate to a company uh, to store, um, to, uh, to allocate space for storage. And that is definitely real. Um, our experience at, at Barnard was uh, we made the case that sustainability for us was uh, part of our mission, that we were actually saving a lot of money um, on buying new materials. And uh, in the end, they actually allocated us a, uh, another storage cage to be able to store our stock. Um, so I think making it sort of uh, uh, tying it to the mission as, as uh, some of our slides in the presentation suggest is maybe a way to, to make the case, but um, Sandra, do you have more insight on how we got that to work? We, we also tied it to the money. We put a dollar value on it. That whole thing of putting a dollar value on stock is not just an internal number, but we were able to go to the administration and say, look, we've got, I forget what it was, like X of thousands of dollars worth of goods. It looks like a pile of you know wood and weird hats to you guys, but it's actually thousands and thousands of dollars worth of worth of goods and it's worth maintaining and storing properly. We still, thousands, space yeah. is still tight. I mean, we're in New York and we have like little corners of basements, don't get me wrong, but we, it worked. We did get a, a extra storage cage. I'm just showing uh, that spreadsheet, how you showed how everything was worth just Charlie, 
Um, I had a I had a question to everyone, which is uh, in the current context of um, theater on hold uh, and reopening plans uh, coming up. Uh, that, as I'm hearing them from theaters around the country, are emphasizing uh, single use, avoiding two pe people touching the same thing more than once. What do we expect the impact of the COVID reopening climate to be on uh, on our sustainability initiatives? And should we address that uh, ju just like the other elephant in the room of um, systemic racism? Um, should uh, does the will the materials address sustainability in the context of um, the uh, operating in a COVID preventative uh, climate. The hop in there one, we've been doing a lot of conversations about that with clients and different folks in the region of uh, the, um, the single use versus reuse. And it's all keying on um, disinfection protocols, if it's multi-use and how to do that well, whether it's UV, C baths, that happen of, of objects after hours between uses or whether it's um, a couple of fogger companies are developing a disinfection solution to operate through theatrical foggers. Um, these are all things that'll help get us away from the minimal use, but our first impact is gonna look horrible. I mean, honestly, it is. Um, one of the weird things though that I noticed going through, especially early COVID days is things like PPE. Um, they come, came up with viable ways to reuse that stuff, like the N95 masks, um, doing peroxide uh, fogging um, to make them reusable. Um, so there's, I suspect we're gonna see two different sides of this before things settle on down. But I think hopefully in the long run, we will actually be in a better spot. And that's me being very optimistic, I suspect. I want to uh, also address the, uh, what you had said about, um, um, uh, you know, talking about Black Lives Matter and, and the way the intersectionality of everything. Um, I had spoke with a friend of color who once told me that when I go into a store with my own bag, uh, the store looks at me as if I'm going to steal something. And so when I had talked about reusable bags, and so I think it's important for us to think about in the sustainability movement of what that means to all people of things that we're asking of the community and how that impacts their lives. And I was wondering if our guests could comment on this, uh, our panelists, or if anybody anybody in the room wants to comment. I know we've spent a lot of um, time in this chat talking about materials, but I do think um, in terms of incorporating what you just mentioned um, it, and what we've talked about too is putting people over products and that could mean um, you know prioritizing local um, women-owned people of color black owned um, companies shops um, you know and making that a priority within our design processes within the, yeah, the whole kind of design production landscape um, as, one, as one idea. And to expand a little bit on what uh, I tried to find out in terms of like uh, targeted development stuff, um, I, I, I feel like a broken record on this, but if we can't come up with an incentive for theaters, then they won't do it. So uh, of the sort of kinds of development, um, the very high end, you know, PepsiCo is still giving some money to places. Uh, what they're missing is the experiential, like have wine with the director and the actors, like that's just gone. But you have the very high end and the very low end, like small crowdsourcing. And so when you're talking about, um, you know, we're using this intermission to re-gear and try and make it so that when we can come back, we can do so more responsibly and spend more money on our people, just like Lauren said. We're hoping that that is like uh, an angle that that can be pursued uh, in this time for post COVID, so that people are not are they're they're giving to environment, they're giving to uh, people, uh, you know, in their area, um, and an arts organization, and not just one of those things independently. 
Oh. And if anyone has development professionals, I'd love to talk to them. <laughs> Who are friends oh. with it? Yeah, Molly. I'll agree with that for a second. I, I've been in my, I have, I have a privileged role at the BGA by being able to listen to a lot of different people in a lot of different places in the theater world. Um, and I hear, I feel like I hear the two messages, the two sides of um, the, the panic, the not being able to come back, the there's too many hurdles. Um, sustainability is going to be left behind because we're so focused on just keeping our small theater alive or, oh my God, it's, it's insurmountable to bring Broadway back. And then on the other hand, there's so many of these gatherings happening now, and there's so much talking, and there's so much use of this forced intermission to think about coming back with this you know, new normal we keep talking about that is just gonna be different because of the uprisings happening on the streets, because of these conversations in rooms, and that definitely leaves me with a lot of hope that we're going to be able to kickstart ourselves, at least, you know, there's going to be challenges. You know, we keep hearing about these single use plastic containers that are coming back and that haunt me at night. Um, but I think that perhaps at the, you know, at these, at these top levels at, you know, in leadership rooms and in rooms like this, that there is this capacity and this door cracked open for change that we haven't seen before. So I, I I think there's these two challenges and um, hopefully between the two of them that 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 needle is going to move. I have a, a reaction to that and it sort of goes back to the, the first question that Anya asked, I think, which is, um, I don't know if anyone on this group, anyone else is on the production managers forum, probably Nikki is. Uh, uh, it, there's been a, a, a lot of conversation on that national email list, which is seven or 800 production managers all across the country. Um, and including the notion that the PMF itself is an inherently flawed institution that just needs to be dismantled. Um, and so, you know, with that sort of in the background, I'm, and I've been really grappling with, um, with white supremacy, my part in it, how I can come to terms with and, and really embrace anti-racism and bring that into my life. I've, I had a moment of thinking, maybe this is not the time. I had a moment of weakness as it were, like maybe this is not the time for sustainability. And then I, then I realized if we dismantle everything and then rebuild it to address racial injustice, but don't address sustainability, we're just going to have to dismantle it and rebuild it again. We need to, if we're going to break things down, we have to build them with racial justice and sustainability in mind at the same time um, and not ignore one for the other. Yeah, that's great. Zanarta, if I pronounce that right, you have a great question. <laughs> I wasn't planning to be on screen, but sure. <laughs> um, I like I had a I had a couple of comments. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, ama amazing. Um which question did I ask? Let's see now. I mean, I think it was kind of answered. Let's hear um, them both. What are your thoughts? Okay, actually, I had a question I was going to note later. So I work in film and TV, um, and I love this presentation. And I almost like, I know you guys have a big team, but I think the film and TV needs to get in on this conversation as well. Um, and, and I was just curious, um, do you guys have plans to maybe work with a production designer or a production manager that works in film and TV um, to get in on this conversation and make a similar type of, uh, you know, sustainability uh, model for that um, area of art? Thanks, Sonata. Um, it's, I can say personally, it's something I think a lot about because I my work does span both worlds in terms of TV, TV film and then um, also theater, and there is so much yeah so much ways to be addressed in the TV and film um, world. We as a group we haven't talked about that, but I think it's a great idea to branch into that. Um, I can tell you right now what exists within that space. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Earth Angel, but they're a great resource that's specifically geared toward um, TV film production. I agree that it would be producers, great. Uh, producers Guild has 
the Producers Guild has um, sustainability guides. There's a Green is Universal. There's some great things going on in, in that. Uh, we we can we can um, send resources on the initiatives that are going on in the in film and TV. There's a lot of great stuff going on there right already. Thank you. And I guess my other question I wrote down, but I think Sandra like touched on it already. Um, I, I love the way you guys interlace the current issues now around um, systemic racism and how it influences the environment. And I just wanted to add maybe possibly to actually use actual examples that have happened recently, like the last 10 years of different towns and cities. So people can really personalize like that this is a real thing. Um, I think that'll be really impactful and it's, it's a great way to uh, connect the presentation together. So that's just a suggestion of what I had. That's fantastic. You know, cause as we've looked around these rooms, a lot of times we do see these white rooms and, and that's something I think is, it, absolutely has to change in order for sustainability to really start, you know, working for everyone is that it meets everyone where we are, which is why we have, you know, having these types of dialogues are so important. Um, so Nectar, in, in where you work, are there people that, um, that you know that are also interested in it, in this? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I'm actually, I got invited by Lauren. Uh, so it's really, she's been, I've been learning a lot from her and then also educating myself, documentary. Uh, I know Hassan Minaj, he did an episode uh, on just like uh, the way the textile industry that was very educational and he he was able to you know infuse humor with that um so i think that times are changing i think people are hungry for a shift and change and i'm just uh i'm kind of tired of seeing news articles of small towns uh where predominantly black people where whether it's like poison water or higher incidences of cancer and all of that that's connected right um, and then not getting um, the right resources available to those towns, right? So this is uh, very much, I, I love what, uh, what's his name? Michael said, he's, I love what he said. It's like, you have to get it at the root and it is connected. So I really appreciate um, you guys having this conversation and I'm very proud of you, Lauren, for bringing all these amazing people together. Thanks, Sonata. Thanks for coming and for your insights. They're always so wonderful. I just want to say like really explicitly for Zanata and the whole group, we are actively looking for contributors. So like if you guys want to, you know, is it okay if we follow up and be like, hey, you mentioned a documentary, what was that? Or can we, you mentioned spam, which I've never heard of. Like if we're hoping to take these thoughts and put them in so that it really is a collective thing that, um, that all of the wisdom from, from this whole community can help inform this process. So I hope that's okay. I've put a, <laughs> a, a link to a, like a feedback spreadsheet in the chat um, for anyone who wants to, um, oh, I didn't, I put in the wrong link. Oh, here we go. Anyway, um, I'm putting in now, I think. Um, yeah, just, uh, we'd love, to be in touch with you, have ideas of uh, other people we can connect with. Um, I, I do think we're, we are at about the 90 minute mark, how we usually do these wing space salons is we'll, we'll keep this open for another half hour for conversation, but we wanna give the opportunity for people who might feel trapped to like uh, step away. Sometimes usually are, are a couple of panelists, like they need a breather right now. Um, but Adrian, do you wanna give our ending Thing, and we can put in a link to the relief fund. Yeah, thank you all. And thank you uh, all of our guests for um, this great conversation. Um, uh, one, uh, one thing to note, um, we have uh, the, the relief fund that I mentioned um, is, uh, is still seeking donations. So uh, we'll add the link in the, in the sidebar there. Um, and then uh, upcoming, our upcoming salon, uh, the next one is uh, Thursday, June 25th at 8 p.m., uh, the future of the art department. Um, uh, moderated by Antia Ellerman and Luke Cantarella with Christy Zay, jo Gord, uh, Jordan Jacobs, Miguel Lopez Castillo, Danny Moyers, Patrice Andrew Davidson, and Oliver Zeller. Uh, 
Um, so join us uh, next Thursday at eight o'clock for that. Um, and then uh, that's it. Thank you all for coming. And uh, we'll keep the video going and the Zoom going for as long as people for another half hour for people to, to chat. So if y'all just want to unmute yourselves and let's have some open dialogue. So just jump in with any of your questions. I have a quick question, actually. I'm, I'm just wondering about the, um, how the toolkit will be circulated. How Will you be reaching out to theaters directly or is it available online somewhere or how can we access it if we want to be suggested to somebody that we're working with? I'm having a little trouble hearing you. I don't know if anyone else. Oh, you know what? She's very interested in the toolkit and how you're going to um, how are you going to get it out there? Will it be online? How could she access it? And and also, um, what other theaters can access it? Good question. <laughs> So um, first of all, I hope I hope that the future of the art department involves sustainability. <laughs> I'm going to just make my bald faced um, pitch. But uh, so basically, this is a draft. You guys are a real. We've had some very small um, kind of friends and family like feedback sessions. But you're, you guys are really our, our first um, larger group to give feedback. Um, our hope is to eventually make this available, publicly available to theaters, production managers, individuals. Um, we're thinking that a good next step would be to, oh, oh my God, sorry, it's my cat. We're hoping a good next step would be to find a few theaters or production managers who are interested in taking a deeper dive and maybe piloting with us. Um, but I have to say, we don't really know exactly like, you know, when we're going to emanate to the wind but if you if you fill out that survey and put your email in it we will definitely let this group know like hey it's done it's out there <laughs> is that accurate edward lauren michael does that sound right you nailed it you need pressure from the community do you need yes. us designers like what kind of things can we do can we sign petitions can we um what do you want us to do to help That is a great question. Um, About the form. <laughs> there you go, Michael. Um, yes, and I guess, yeah, offer your feedback in the form. Um, if you have resources, any other stories you'd like to share with us, please um, feel free to do so. Because I think, um, as Sandra noted when we were working on this together, I think one of the pitfalls of this kind of work is reinventing the wheel. Um, so we're not trying to do that. We wanna combine efforts and talents and resources. Um, and that's where you all come in. So feel free to connect. I'm gonna add on to this one. Since Danielle, Danielle opened up that door, I'm gonna go in there. <laughs> yes, fill out the survey. Yes, help us build this thing. Commit to sustainable practices in your own art. Demand sustainability from every theater and production manager that you work with. Do it nicely and politely, but whatever, ask for it. Um, help us uh, make this link between issues of racism, issues of uh, you know financial problems from coronavirus and the and climate change. Like all of the above. Like there is no way that this work is going to happen unless people in our industry really step up and and start to to demand it. I mean, something that occurs to me just seeing how many set designers in particular are represented is to just find out what theater that like six or more, like what theater has both Wilson, Danielle, five other set designers here worked at. And that might be a theater to reach out to saying like, these are people who are interested. Like we know that these eight set designers are interested in this. We would love for you to do a pilot program if your production manager is still employed. Can you have them devote two weeks to that this summer? I would definitely suggest Berkeley Rest for starters. And also you can the Goodman in Chicago. Berkeley and Goodman. Yeah, good good choices. Yeah, Sandra, I was really inspired by you talking about Denver Center Theater and getting their prop shop on board because I work there too. And I feel like now I'm inspired to just whichever theater I go into, just kind of announcing yourself as saying, you know, let's make this as sustainable and as recyclable as possible. 
and I feel like that's the thing that people could really, you know, like work towards at least. Because I feel like also as designers, we go into these theaters and they want to provide us with the design that we give them. They want to give us options and all this stuff. But I think if you just announce from the get go, it's like, you know what, let's see what you, what can you do from what you already have? Then they work from that point of view as, a po as opposed to the other point of view of like getting exactly what it is that you asked for without really thinking about like, what do we have adjacent to it? That's true, Wilson. I, I think I mentioned that my my sort of take on a, a particularly Yale design training, which was like fill the, the black box, but you know, just from the other end on the in the TDP program, we are trained to provide exactly what the designer drew, no matter what, right? As close as we humanly can get. So um, it doesn't just come from one or or the other direction. Both both sides have to be willing to 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 sort of get there together which brings a great point and i think we should go to anya because educators could have a huge a huge responsibility here and actually like maybe teaching designers it's okay to ask it's okay to ask for what i want for, for to um to stand up for something i believe in anya ask, um what's your question well yeah i mean it's connected you know i teach at a at a university and i feel that that is the easiest place where i could bring this i mean your tool hit your toolkit however not fully finished it is i mean i would love to share this with my entire department tomorrow and um because of the research component that sandra mentioned in universities i feel like there is there's already this potential buy-in for um for progress but uh to uh to michael's point last time i spoke to a yale trained fantastic technical director at a regional theater i don't want to out him just in case but he said to me that this conversation is um has a bigger context like it has to do with you can't just come in and do one show this way you have to plan ahead of time for the whole season and uh and as such, you know, all of these freelance, he pointed the finger at directors that you're bringing in, you can't really drop, like, how do you drop that bomb on them that they have to work within these particular limits? So I, I'm curious if you guys could address this question of, in the context of specifically professional theaters, of um, sustainability that kind of drags the entire planning, um, season timeline with it and directors who are coming in from the outside. Anya, I'd actually offer that my potential colleague from the drama school is wrong. It can absolutely be done on a show by show basis. And to me, that's, I mean, I don't know the person you're referring to, of course, but it sounds lazy. Um, if, if you approach it with the right perspective, you can absolutely do it as a one off. And it means it has to be collaborative, of course. You know, other concessions have to be made. So let's say if the budget was 10,000 for scenery, we can still do it for 10,000. Um, if we're doing, we don't have to use stock materials if, um, if that doesn't work for what you have. I mean, stock meaning what we have, like we have sheets and sheets of plywood sitting on the racks ready to be used that, we, that, are, that are still virgin. But if you don't want to use that, um, and instead you want to use some, some other material that makes sense um, from you, for your design, it just has to be part of the plan. So, I mean, that's, I'm, I'm maybe selfishly disappointed to hear that one of our students is communicating that because it's counter to what we, what our pedagogy is in exactly what Michael described of um, our goal is to make the vision achieved. And if your vision is to do X, Y, Z as sustainably as possible, then, then that's our job, our meaning the TD slash production manager. Um, so yeah, if you want to if you want to download offline, I'd be happy to chat because that sounds like maybe I'm missed a mark in in educating my own students. No, this was a or this was an older an older graduate who is fantastic. So perhaps there, you know, I need to get more specific about the scope of the sustainability that we're talking about. But thank you so much for your response. Yeah, totally. And I think, like you said, if you're willing to to, to have that be a back and forth and you say, I, I understand that this means I might have to sacrifice this in order to achieve this. I don't have to have this exact thing. This is the general concept, but I'm willing to, to do, what it need, do what needs to be done in order to achieve this other thing that's really important to me. 
I think what Nikki said just said is really important that whenever you are opening this conversation about sustainability, you do have to know that there are some sensitivities out there. There are some there are some perceptions that this is going to make my life harder. This is going to be more work. This I don't have time for this in my shop. And those are sometimes real and sometimes just sensitivities and it almost doesn't matter, right? Whether it's real or perceived, you, you, you have to be sensitive to it yourself as the designer, the same way you would with any other sensitivity in the shop. Like I'm going into this shop and I know this is a shop that just doesn't have enough over hires. And I know that, you know, this is a problem. So, so I try to be really upfront about it and say like, I am committed to doing this and I'm also committed to doing this in a way that is sustainable for the people who work in this theater. I'm not gonna sacrifice the life, the hours, the you know, heartache of my colleagues for this. We're gonna do it human sustainability and environmental. And you have to say it over and over again because um, rightfully so production people sometimes don't believe you because they often, as Michael said earlier, bear the brunt of a lot of stuff. So, um, and then I think we should talk about talking with directors if people are interested. I feel like it's come up a bunch of times. Like Edward and Lauren, you, have you guys, or Danielle, anybody? I feel like there's been some stuff in the chat about that or, or people not into that. People have certainly been asking about it in the chat. Um, I mean, I, I do think uh, directors have, have more clout and so getting them on board. I'm trying to think through all of my Questions that are sustainable. Um, yeah, I don't know that the director really approached it uh, be, before we did, but um, if there are a couple directors in the room, it'd be wonderful to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I um, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you yeah. hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting to hear this conversation because I feel like I would love. I mean, I could easily always say when I encounter a director, I want to work this way, but I probably have a lot of things in my head is like, oh, maybe the, the the designer doesn't want to. I feel like there's all these kind of invisible barriers that if we if the if the conversation could be wider, it would be such a relief because because um, because it's not something I had occurred to me, like how much power I have in this position um, when I, cause I'm commonly like, if I'm looking for a different designer to work with, you know, that this is the one, this is one of the things I should talk to them about, you know what I mean? In my selection process or whatever. And I, um, and I, I kind of feel like a lot of directors would just like to kind of have this information and know like, oh, that there seems to be a barrier between directors and designers where really there may not naturally be one. And so it would kind of be, I think it would kind of be a relief. And I, and I wonder how directors might be able to disseminate these ideas amongst ourselves to kind of ease these, these layers of barriers. I'm kind of just thinking this through. I'm kind of thinking that as designers, we kind of have to like trick directors into sustainable practices. Cause it's like when you do a design process, you know, like you want to talk very artistically, freely, like what should this show be like? So like, you don't want to like, directors don't want to feel like as though they're being hemmed into a design, you know, they want, they want to like discover what the design is. But maybe yeah. in that process, we are always thinking about sustainable practices and steering it towards something sustainable. Yeah, but I feel like talking about materiality is part of the conversation of design. Like, I don't, I don't go in and I'm just like, I have this idea in my head and I need someone to tell me they can do what I have in my head. I'm looking for someone, an artist that I want to collaborate with. And, and if we agree, in a values way about being concerned about this, then it's, and I don't, I don't think there's that probably that big of a barrier. I mean, I could be wrong. Like I'm, I'm from a, like a downtown. So a lot of my work, we, we just have to have more sustainable solutions because we don't have giant budgets and we have to, we're constantly reusing things. You, you know what I mean? But, but it also just occurs to me that there's probably just a tiny bit of work that has to be done where this is a conversation that if directors had amongst their themselves, that a lot of this could kind of 
I think some of the barriers would would fall away pretty easily. That would be my my guess because I think a lot of directors are concerned about this as well. I love what you said, the invisible barriers, because truly, I think we all do. We sort of believe that somebody else is not interested in this, or somebody else doesn't want to listen. When actually, we all could be that person. We all could be the activists in this environment. Mm -hmm. But I think I think it's it's tough to believe that we have the power. Um, and sort of we, I still, you know, in a way we're always like, well, what about those folks? Well, what about those folks? Thinking that other people are actually not interested in it. But I can tell in this room here, I mean, we have so many people in this room who are interested in. So I think it's kind of across the board. I just, I'm so glad, thank you for bringing that up. Invisible barrier. Danielle, the, the uh, I, I couldn't agree more. People uh, tend to think other people are the ones who have the power and the power in this room is significant. I had lunch, People, have, some people have heard me tell this story before, I had lunch with the producer of uh, a Tony Award winning producer who uh, said, I can understand what a director or a stage manager or a designer can do, but what can I do about sustainability? I'm just the producer. And <laughs> everyone else is sitting there saying, oh, if only we could get the producer involved. But she, th this was not facetious. This was her legitimate question. What can I do? I'm, I'm the producer. My answer to her was, let the people around you know that this is important to you and they'll come up with things in the areas of their expertise. The people who chose you, as, as Mallory said, they're cho you're choosing this person to work with you because you respect them, you enjoy working with them. When they know this is important to you, people will do more and more things. So uh, as Danielle said, don't assign your power to the person you think is gonna say no. The, we, this, group can, this group has influenced a tremendous number of people, will continue to influence people. This group has so much power beyond what we let ourselves know. No, I, I can I also oh go ahead, Zach. Sorry, I was just gonna say when you're speaking, I, like you can change the word sustainability and systemic racism interchanging as far as we can be empowered and continue our conversations, and they are intertwined in the sense of there's this sort of like blind spot of white supremacy and sort of dialogue that we are all like now understanding and and uh, uh, engaging in that is similar to sustainability. Like once you have the knowledge, you have the power. So we just keep pushing forward in that regard and we can make change. What I was going to say is um, I work primarily in design of buildings, they're theaters, right? And these tend to be a monumental design that somebody's going to do that is sort of the career making design or defining building on somebody's campus. And in that world, there is a system called LEAD, Leadership in Environmentally Efficient Design, I believe it is, um, that all of a sudden the design and construction world adopted. It was kind of like somebody hit a switch. And it's a way of scoring the, the design of the building and the design process um, to give it a, a kind of quantifiable number of how sustainable it is. Um, and I think it's an interesting, an interesting model to be perhaps adapted to the production world. I, I was a production manager earlier in my life before I got onto the building design side. Um, and it's, um, when, when it hit, we went from uh, circulating paper drawings all over the country when we were designing a building to not. And that difference, um, it sounds minor, but like we worked on Austin city limits in Austin. Um, by the time that building opened, I had a stack of paper of drawings about four and a half feet tall um, that were all of the updated drawing sheets and things that had come through in the time. And by one day saying, okay, we're going to circulate this stuff electronically, boom, they all, that all that disappeared. The carbon footprint from shipping, it disappeared. It was, it was stunning and it was in an industry not likely to adopt this too willingly. Um, and I think part of it is that it kind of became a competition, you know, oh, you know, I got a lead platinum, you know, what did you do on my building? Um, 
So I think it's it's an interesting it's an interesting model. And the other thing I'll say in terms of the design process, where we're going through very extended design processes on buildings, um, one meeting together counts, right? Um, that's where you establish your initial relationships if it's done well. And after that, we tend to do all of our meetings online. Um, you know, I'm I'm years into being in a uh, go-to meeting or Zoom or something like that because that's the way we work. Um, and it's once you start doing it, it's very easy, <laughs> you know? So I think I think the theater world adapting to that, um, I don't think it's as big a hump as we think it is. I think it's just a matter of us deciding one day to do it um, as an industry. And perhaps something like LEAD, for theaters, it could be leadership and environmentally efficient production. Leap um, could be could be something that would help focus. I don't know. Throwing it out there. I'd like to push. Oh, I want to push back on that a little bit, Curtis. Sure. I, I I feel like lead is a great thing to think about in terms of way we model things because it it seems that it both functions as a way of signaling kind of good intentions on yes. the part of both the architects and, and the culture. Um, even though I think there's a lot of literature around lead that suggests the buildings aren't as efficient and aren't as sustainable necessarily as they promise to be. And in the total like scope of construction as an industry, lead represents like a sort of symbolic layer mm -hmm. often that's happening in the symbolic realms of building like theaters mm -hmm. um like corporate headquarters that are like function not necessarily for like totally utilitarian purposes in our society mm -hmm. but rather to do this kind of other work and i were i i think that like we need to be aware in the ways in which like art also provides that symbolic role and having these adjacencies to other forces in our culture uh, allow art to be um, kind of put to work to do the good work that the other parts of the culture aren't doing. Like I, I love materials for the arts because I really love going there, getting like really dirty and, 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 and spending hours pulling things out. But, and I feel like I'm doing good work, like I'm finding things that would be thrown out. But I'm also like providing this way in which like really other much bigger, more wasteful industries are kind of like um, having a relationship with me where I where we're like validating their wastefulness mm -hmm. by saying like, look, your waste, we'll do beautiful things with it and we'll upcycle it and, and we'll create value out of it. And it's like, although it's not to say that us doing that is a, isn't like a, a good, valuable thing, but also I think it's also caught in a kind of relationship with something that's a, like a larger problematic. I, I agree, and lead is horribly imperfect, honestly, um, or especially in its early days, you got more points for ripping down a building and building one in its place than you did for actually just repairing that building that started. It was terrible, but it infected non-lead building design with that conversation of how can we do this better? And that's where I think it has its greatest value, honestly, is it changed a culture? Um, is it has it changed it completely to where it should be? No, but it's it's a darn good start, I think. Um, so, I mean, it's in in the not reinventing the wheel. It might be part of a larger part of the toolkit in a much longer run. You know, something you, like that. Do you guys think of sustainable art production being an infectious agent in that way, or a change agent? Like, is it a model for how other industries that scale? so much bigger than our industry uh, could function if we show them we can function in this way or or or, or is it is it a is it a sort of more of like a, this is my backyard you know in no, terms for of me where it's we're going to do the work it's well it's the both it's it's the, your backyard and for me it's about working in a way that sort of aligns with my personal values but the first thing you said luke is really really important i think and i do believe that the theater industry has um, a lot to offer, like the, the term that we're beginning, that we're talking about here is the circular economy, right? Which about, you know, 10 years ago was like, you know, nothing, like a little fringe term. And here we are 10 years later, we've got a major work going on about it. We have millions of dollars of investment from BlackRock. 
from Accenture, from all these companies trying to get in on the party. And theater, I think, has a really unique point of view, a really unique capacity to think about, about circularity as a framework for design. Because first of all, we have literally thousands of years of experience doing it. We can tackle questions like you just raised, Luke. I loved what you just said about like the kind of myth of sometimes reuse, like if of if if it's if it's all the like, you know, organizations with money that then give their stuff to materials for the arts and it's up to us to make stuff out of it. Like, no, that's not the end goal. That is not enough. That is not at all the destination. The destination is is entirely flipping our value system of what we spend our money on and what we think should we should spend our money on. And so um, I think that we can, as theater artists, actually stand up and say, yeah, we have something to teach the broader system of production and consumption because we are actually small enough to do it and well, then to show people. And, look at, and looking at the people on the screen, we've got people who are bridging multiple industries here. Um, so, you know, Lauren is going to bring what she's doing from the theater world into the film world. Charlie is, is in the trucking world. He's bringing that into a whole other world too. And theater's being so highly visible and highly, um, I mean, just obvious when, they're, when you're doing something wrong, well, especially if you're doing something like a scorecard in your programs, um, how could others not notice? I think we are an infectious agent. I hope we are. Zach. Hi, uh, I'm Zach, uh, he, him. Uh, I have some two, two, two questions really quick. Well, one, I just wanted to say thank you, um, but also I want to say, uh, I'm a light, lighting designer, so I was just going to say, um, when I was at Williamstown in like the early 2000s, the main stage used to be a rep light plot, which was about labor sustainability, um, which now doesn't exist the same way anymore, but that's a whole other thing, which obviously it's all coming out with Williamstown right now. But um, I was going to say in your presentation, if the LEDs were an option, perhaps color changing LEDs are an option because then you don't need any gel and you don't, and you make the color changing LED rep plot. So it's only about focus. Everything just exists. It's all the same cables, all the same stuff because now technology is so versatile. There is, there actually is a way in in lighting that because things are so versatile that you can leave things where they are and still feel like everything's brand new for every production. Um, that's actually for... part of the, that's one of the slides that we skipped. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay, great. Um, thank you. Um, and I was going to ask uh, a quick question, oh, two questions. One is, so I know this actually probably came up in the USA group at one point I remember reading, but it's so like regarding sustainability and reusing scenery or stock objects, whose work is that? Like, who, like how do you bill whose object that is that was originally designed for a different production but reused for another production? I'm curious of what the, like what that would be. Um, and also, because I work a lot in the commercial model, I'm curious if you have um, guidance or anything regarding sustainability for, for humans as well as objects um, in the commercial model, because commercial producers are, are less sort of interested in, in human um, things, as well as, uh, which I love that idea. I just, I'm curious how they could, what, what the pushback would be for where you spend this money to put on the stage because the audience is it has different expectations in commercial versus sort of institutional. I might add to uh, jump in on the commercial question because my business is mostly in commercial as well. Yeah, that's um, true. Um, you know, it's it is the pre it's the way I choose to work, and um, whether or not the producers know that I choose to work this way or the team knows I choose to work with this way, it's not really. I don't care. Honestly, I don't care. I mean, I think you, 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 we all have our ethics and we, we bring, hopefully our ethics uh, help us make our, the choices that we do for our practice. And I, I feel like, I feel like we're kind of always expecting somebody else to sort of um, say something about it. And I, I just feel like it's just a change. It's just like changing the way you think, right? Like you are talking about like social justice and, and, and climate justice are the same thing. It's really, it's just changing our worlds, our, our small worlds. Um, basically, as long as you get the job done, I think that's all that matters, you know? And so if I choose to uh, change a piece of scenery that was four feet, four inches by six foot, eight inches, so I could get it into a four by eight, 
you know, sheet good, then that's that's my choice as a designer. So I think that we there, there are not so many choices out in the world that has to be everybody else. There's like very there's like choices that we can make individually. And as long as you're not going over budget, you know, which a lot of times that's the issue, don't go over budget. So as long as you don't go over budget and you try to make the you like change your design to stick within the budget and it's and it's a sustainable design. Then I don't. There's not really that tension that I think we create these these the idea of these tensions when they don't actually need to exist. I find that intriguing because I have constantly been told that whatever the designer draws, that is what you build, no matter what. Because it's not my job. I'm a prop person to dictate what can be put on stage. I am to create the vision of the directors as translated by the designer. Um, so I find it intriguing that here I am sitting in a room full of people who are saying, no, I can tell a designer, wait, I have this exact couch, but it's a foot shorter. When, when I have been in those meetings where I've gotten yelled at for supplying the couch that was a foot shorter and told I was ruining the production. This is so great. Thank you, Patrick, for asking this question. <laughs> Anybody else want to jump on this? I know I got a lot to say about it. But yep, the panelists. I just want to say that you, yeah, it's really hard if you're alone. If you're the only person, if you don't have any institutional backup and you're the person who's like, we should not use that couch and you're all by yourself, it is, you are in a horrible position. And, and I have actually been in that position as a designer when I didn't have backup from the producer or the, or anybody, the, the director, I've had directors who I had to sort of like, you know, so I just kind of want to acknowledge that that's very real. Um, which I guess is one of the reasons we're, we're, we're trying to talk about the role, many different roles and the role of the institution as well. Um, I think I'll pause there. Now, I will say I've had different experiences with different designers. Some designers are, are very easy to talk to, very communicative. One of them happens to be on this call, although he hasn't made it back home yet. Um, so a lot of times it is about the communication and understanding what has to change. Um, I did want to hit a little bit, though, on some of the COVID and what our institution, I'm with the University of Michigan and the theater department there. We are actually discussing what props need to do on stage to be, still be usable, both in the rehearsal process and in show process. And a lot of it is very simple things like instead of letters being passed from one person to another, making three copies of the same letter and having each one of them pull it out of their own pocket so that there's not passing off of things or making sure that glassware is not shared. And that is something that we're having to make sure that the directors buy in on from the get-go to make sure that those things aren't passed from person to person. Um, Again, that requires, though, the director buy-in on that. And if you don't have that, if they feel that it's necessary for, and we're also this coming, at least for the fall term, possibly for the entire year, we're using no soft goods. Um, as Danielle and other people said, um, yeah, it can be very hard when you feel like the lone voice, but uh, hopefully, uh, when this kit is complete, it can be something that can also work sort of from the top down to, to talk to production managers, general managers, uh, to talk about what the, how working sustainably works with an institution's mission. Um, and uh, because that will give you a lot more ammunition uh, as the props manager uh, to, to draw that line in the sand um, and say that this is this is this is the more sustainable, more responsible way of doing this. Uh, the shorter sofa. I, I'm really. Uh, this is the first time we've had this many people here, like two hours in. But we do feel obligated to sort of wrap up, um, to be respectful of um, at least two of our panelists have children that they've. <laughs> uh, 
uh, that they need to get to. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I have multiple people messaging me that we have to wrap it up. So we have to wrap it up. Uh, there are links in the chat uh, to uh, feedback survey, uh, to if you want to donate to salons, to uh, our Wingspace Relief Fund. Uh, a huge thank you to the whole salons committee as well. Um, Adrian Jones, uh, Luke Cantarella, Elizabeth Mack, Kate Freer, Leon Arnold, Lee Savage, uh, who have been helping do these every two or three weeks. I'm sure I missed someone and I'm really sorry. Um, and thank you so much to Sandra Goldmark and Michael Banta and Lauren Gaston uh, for uh, helping uh, and myself for helping to put together all this. And thank you so much, Danielle. Uh, this is Danielle's second uh, uh, green salon today. She hosted something with the Broadway Green Lines earlier today. Um, and so thank you, Danielle, for coming and, and helping lead the conversation, move everything forward. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to click end pretty soon. Thank you all for coming and participating. Thanks for having us, Wing Space. Thanks, Thank everybody. You, everybody. Thank you for coming, Molly, Nikki, Curtis. Thank you, Curtis. We'll be in touch, Curtis. Oh, it's my wife. Hi, y'all. Bye, Bye, Nikki. Thanks Bye. again. Thank you for coming, Patrick. You always get so quiet towards the call end. Call later this summer. Let's have a call. <laughs> yes, absolutely. See you, friends.